Thank you, Barbara. <coughs> Thank you for all of you being here. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Mike Kennedy. I represent an outline Cedar Hills and Highland North Utah County. And I think sex education is something that probably I was asked to speak about because um, you see the first qualification on a doctor and we talk about sexual relationships routinely in the office on multiple levels for the young as or older. And so I, I'm not sure exactly why Barbara otherwise asked me to do this, but it's good to be here with you and to talk with you about this important topic. So first I wanted to start with a, an analogy I had an interesting experience as a legislator. I was elected in 2012, and uh, I received a, occasionally received letters from my constituents, and I received a packet of letters from a, a local elementary school, and, and that was one very interesting letter from one particular child. These were fifth graders, and, and um, it was clearly an assignment that had been rendered by the teacher that everybody, all the students write a letter to their local legislator. So I read through these letters and, and one of them specifically talked about uh, the fact that the school lunches were not adequate for this young man. And it was, of course it was a boy, girls don't usually care much about that sort of thing, but the um, boys, they, they care about their school lunches. And he actually asked me to pass a law that would allow more food in a school lunch. So I've given you some details about the school lunch program in the state of Utah. This is Utah specifically, and I've gathered some of these for the state of Utah. There's 54, over 54 million lunches served in the state of Utah in a year's time. And in the state, we have over 650,000 students that are in the state. And with 180 days of instruction, I ran some of these numbers, and that estimates about 47% of our children receive school lunches. This is not a criticism or a condemnation of that process, but I, I asked the question at the end of this slide, why? Why are 47% of our students receiving school lunches? Tell me about that. And I, I prefer audience interaction. I think it's always more interesting if we talk together than if you just listen to the stage on the stage and kind of have to just sort of tolerate me for the 25 minutes that I'll be speaking. So why is it that 47% of our children are receiving school lunches? Please. Are you talking about free lunches or lunches just school lunch. purchased? Yeah. School lunch. Purchased lunches yes. from families? Purchased and free, yes. Okay. Purchased and free. Well, what is that all about, Elisa? Well, I think that sometimes it's easier to let someone else do something for us than it is to do it ourselves. Tell me about that. What's What's easier about the school lunch process than, than uh, the brown bag? And, and I don't know about you, but it was brown bag when I was a kid. I mean, you got brown bag uh, school lunch. At, uh, raise your hand if you, if you did the brown bag thing. Just bring your lunch from home, right? How hard is that? The majority of this room, that's what you did. We've had a transformation in the past 30 years or 40 years. There, there's a difference now. What is that difference? And it's a, this is just an analogy, but it's a fundamental analogy that reflects what our society expects others to do for them that they should and can do for themselves. What is, what is it that this school lunch thing is reflecting in our society? Well, I think that there's a lot of working couples, okay. mom and dad. There's so a societal one transformation, a lot of, very good. So, so there's not necessarily a home person and a work person. There's two work people and the home on some level is unattended. Who's got the time or the capacity to make food for a child? That's, that's a good point. So we have double income families, so two workers, and who's got time to make lunch for the child? Very good, what else? Our daughter has five children in school, and so the backup plan, if they run out of lunch foods, then it's to purchase lunch, so it's it's a, a nice backup plan. Yes, so for it's nice of children. because it's convenient, there's a lot of children, very good, what else? Well, I know when I went to school, my parents said you could choose one lunch each week, and so we buy that the rest of the time, we just take our own lunch. But that was, you know, that doesn't add up to 47%. Yeah, it was um, kind of a treat to get the hot lunch at school, yeah. but now it's becoming the norm. And it's very interesting to watch that normalize, that, that actually we eat out more than we home make these items. Was there another hand over here? Yes, I was just saying, while well, I was working, which I didn't work for all of them, and I had five children, but I was a teacher, and I used to, for time's sake, I would freeze their stuff ahead of time, and so they all said, just let us eat it. Yes. 
<laughs> it's um, it takes yes, it takes time and prep, and sometimes the stuff that the commercial entity, in this case the school, tastes better than what you get at the home. So, and by the way, on the family doctor side of thing, I'll tell you that one of the fundamental problems with people's health and well-being is they're eating a lot more prepared food, and prepared food is delicious. The reason why it's delicious boils down to three fundamental components: sugar, fat, and salt. One of those three, or all those three, are enhanced in these commercial items, and so sort of an obesity epidemic in our society as well. So, so I, please. I think it reflects the entitlement program of the federal government. So entitlement in what fashion? That's, that's a good term to use. What do you mean by entitlement? The entitlement program involves a lot of uh, well, entitlements. You start trying for those and want them. Not thinking where they come from and who pays for it. And who pays for it is a, by the way, you were one of my professors at BYU, weren't you? Were you a professor at BYU? Yes. Very good. Did you, did you did you great. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was an excellent class, by the way. I, I just recognize you. Yeah, it's, been, it's been a few years for both of us. But, um, but yeah, an entitlement associated with somebody else can do this for me, it's easier to have somebody else do it, all you need to do is put some money into it, or in some cases I just expect the federal government to do it for me, and lo and behold, they will do it for you. And when the government moves in, a lot of entities will move out. So mothers and fathers, when government provides, mothers and fathers will push off their fundamental responsibilities of feeding the child to somebody else, which I think is a very interesting transition. Yes. I'm on my little girl's elementary school board, <clears throat> and one thing that we've discussed recently is that um, we have <clears throat> a lot of underprivileged children at our school, and I think for them, they they see it as a, an opportunity to get food without having to pay for it, and so that might be one of the reasons that that's gone up. Yes. Very good, so I like that analogy. And, and so I was confronted with this letter from this child, and essentially I wrote back to the child and said, thank you for your letter, it's a pleasure to hear from my constituents. I think your mother and father are better suited to determine how much food you need in your school lunch than is the state government. And I recommend that you speak to them about your school lunches and their adequacy than that you send a letter to the legislator. Now, what do you expect from a fifth grade boy? It's not, this is not Armageddon on public policy. The, the boy was just spouting off at the top of his head. I don't mean to get too far into that, but I would also reflect that we sometimes do expect our government to do things for us, and it's a little disturbing to me, things that we should really be doing for ourselves. And the question for us that we all should be considering is are there things that we have done that with our families or with our individual circumstances? And by the way, not to not to hit to too private of a circumstance, but how many in the room are Medicare recipients, and how many of the room in the room would be interested in Medicare changing? That you're back on the market, you have to buy your own insurance. So it is. Uh, it's very interesting to see that we all protect our our little pieces. We're all interested in making sure things stay the same for us, but other people need to change. We all need to be more independent and liberty-minded. So to move into comprehensive sexual education component, I wanted to start with uh, one aspect of that, and that's the National Sexuality Education Standards, which was published in 2012. It's a 46-page document that outlines a variety of sexual education standards, and I, I suppose most of us wouldn't necessarily think that those kind of entities are out there, but they are. There are people that that's what they do, is they think about what kind of standards uh, we need to have for sexual education. And it describes for different age groups what kind of standard education needs to be had for those individuals. And I, I wanted to, and I know most of the people, if not all the people in this room can read, so I'll just show you some of these standards. This is grade K through 12, or K through 2, which the first question that's interesting is really, do we want to start kindergarten with this sort of thing? So I'll just let you read through some of those standards that are there. And I'd like you to reflect on whether or not you think those standards are good standards to have or not. First, before I move off this slide, I'd like you to comment, if you would, about kindergarten through second grade. And what do you think about those standards? Any, any thoughts about what's there? Please. I would just say 
that I think human nature hasn't changed that much. So even though things in our culture have, when I was in second grade, that is the least, the least point that I would have been concerned about or wanted to talk about at all. So on some level, when we start standardizing these and we're pushing this down to kindergarten through second grade and talking about whether or not your friends are good friends or not, things like that. The, the question is, do the children really need to think about those kind of things? Do we need to make a curriculum to address those? That's a good point. Very good. In the back, yes? Um, so the part says, identify different kinds of family structures. Uh -huh. I'm not cool with that. Why not? Well, because we've taught our daughter and, and our son that a family, by definition to us, is a man and a woman, and they may have children together. And, and if they want to adopt, great, you know, we can get into all that. But, but this is going to, it's teaching a family is also a woman and a woman, and a man and a man. And, and so they're getting indoctrinated by these other different kinds of family structures, as it says. I don't like that. In general, I'd say that opens the door for a lot of flexibility about a variety of lifestyles for us in our school system to discuss. And well, so they're teaching it as though it's okay. Those, right? Right. Yes, a, a good point. Thank you. I was going to say the same thing. I reiterate that that's a deliberate attempt to indoctrinate to young children alternative lifestyles. So the interesting question, and I, we're going to read through the proposal for the Comprehensive Sexual Education that, that was made last year, and I, I suspect in 2018, as the, the session starts a week from Monday, that Brian King is going to propose another, another version of this. But one of the fundamental issues with this is the Trojan horse aspect, is that it looks like one thing, and you move it in, and it's, it's fine and acceptable, but then once it's in, you can unpack it and there are things in there that you may or may not approve of. And that the question for us is not necessarily, is this concept a bad concept? It is, number one, is does it stand for other things that will evolve and change over time into something that we may not approve of down the way or we may not like? And there, there's another fundamental aspect to this, and I'll, I'll say it right now. And it's not that these topics are bad to discuss. But it's the right venue. Where where should these things be discussed? At all. And we can have different opinions about that. But um, I I heard family from the audience. Is it appropriate for a doctor to talk about this with a patient? So I'd like you to think about these things because I I actually in studying this bill, I think there's a lot of really good topics for conversation. But what I'm concerned about is that many times we as parents are unwilling to do these things for ourselves, or even as grandparents. I know some of these, some of the people in the room have grandchildren. And when was the last time you pulled your grandchild aside and had these conversations? Would they be comfortable with that? What is the difference between a family setting, a school setting, a doctor setting, to have these conversations? And what is the benefit and drawback of these different venues for the conversations? So those are some general topics that I'd like you to think about. Let's move on. So this is grades 9 through 12 standards. I'll let you read through those, and I'd like your response, again, for this, this sexual education standardization process, 46-page document. I just lifted a few of those off and put them up. Go ahead and read through those, and then tell me what your responses are to some of these standards. By the way, I didn't try to pick any that were particularly controversial or possibly useful. Uh, I just wanted to pull out some of these. So what are your thoughts about what you see on some of those reflected standards? Scary. Tell me, uh, why do you respond now? It, it, given a teacher with a kind of a twisted orientation, it opens the door to all kinds of indoctrination. So you suspect there are nefarious teachers out there that may not use this and uh, this tool in the right way. Is that what you're suggesting? My experience is that there are. Okay. 
And sadly in the news, uh, we read about that occasionally where teachers have issues, frankly doctors have issues, and police officers have issues, and people, Hollywood is full of issues, aren't they? <laughs> Directors and producers, but, but uh, one of the dynamics is that again, we've shifted from somebody that loves, cares for the parent, cares for the child, we've shifted that off to somebody else. We don't really know what they are or what they think. And as a result, we kind of give up our rights and opportunities to, to address that in a more appropriate fashion. You have a comment? I think that there's a legal implication as well that then if, if certain things become legal, then the parents actually lose their legal rights. And then there are lawsuits that, that would incur, that parents would have to maybe fight in order to protect their rights as a parent. And that's, that's a huge problem. Meaning once we give up this opportunity that we have, for example, to discuss sexual education with our children, we, we foist that onto another entity, we may never recover that opportunity formally. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, and legal action can be taken against parents who, who have conflicts with what's on the books as legal rights for schools, then there's conflict. It's very interesting. Thank you for that mm -hmm. comment, please. Um, we had a daughter that went through years of chemotherapy because of leukemia. Wow. At age 16, she was finally uh, released from the thoughtful care of primary children. And the doctor that spoke with her was a woman who uh, almost went immediately into sexual uh, orientation and how she could provide her with contraceptives. And I'm sitting here, what are you talking about? I'm prepared, you know? She had me leave the room. So she could resume, resume. And uh, my daughter said, I didn't let like what she said bother me or do it. But I thought, you know, this, this was a doctor <laughs> doing this with my daughter without my permission. And I did not appreciate that. Very interesting. Thanks for that statement. Uh, that is, it's important that we remember who's in charge and who's the one that is ultimately accountable for the the care of our children, and I would say I've had those conversations as well with some of my patients. We always try to do that with the consent and the approval of the parent. Frankly, I'd rather the parent be there than not, but that's an important, that's an important statement. Thanks. Any other comments on what we see there on the standards? Yeah? The things that I'm looking at up there shouldn't be taught in the classroom way. I, I have strong opinions, and I, you know, I have a lot to say. No, you don't have strong opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You never would have asked. Okay. But um, the point is, I shouldn't be in the classroom teaching those things, and neither should you or anybody else in this room. What is the, that what is, is not the place. Why, why not? That's actually a great point. And that's one of the points I wanted to drive home with this conversation is, what is it about a standard classroom that makes it a less ideal circumstance than, than particularly an individual conversation with the, with the person. Gail, did you have a comment on that? Well, first of all, it's a classroom full of girls and boys. It's not sensitive to each child in there. Every child, this is very sensitive information. And each child and each family handles it differently. Each religion, I mean, the list can go on and on. Right. And you put all that together into one room with one person's opinion, you have very confused children, parents that aren't there and don't know what's going on, don't know how to talk to their children about it, don't even know it's happened most of the time. So when right. the child comes home from school, unless it's a child like my daughter who walked in one day and said, sit down, Mom, I have something you need to know. And it was about sex education at the top of their school. She wasn't in there. But most, when I called around and talked to parents, I found out none of those children came home and gave to their parents the information, the, the brochure on how to put on a condom and all those things that was passed out in Highland at the